All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Chris. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, as Chris mentioned, I'll be speaking today on invasive plants and fire increasers, decreasers, and management strategies. I've been involved in invasive species control since around 2004-ish and uh, prescribed fire in one way or another since around 2010. So this is a topic of great interest to me and I hope uh, you all um, take something away from it. Uh oh, my screen. Oh, there we go. It's advancing. Good. <laughs> okay. So just a little overview before we get into it. Uh, why do we burn and control invasives? Uh, which species increase or decrease with fire? And spoiler alert, it depends. <laughs> it's complicated and can be very difficult to generalize, but uh, we're gonna give it our best shot. We're gonna do a little bit of generalization but we're also going to do a little more nuanced looks at individual species and how they react to fires under different circumstances. Uh, but with that in mind, site specifics will dictate the preferred methods of managing invasive plants, along with the many other objectives um, that you might have with prescribed fire. So you should definitely consult a professional in your region if that's at all possible. Uh, and then we'll close out with some further considerations. So you'll see how complex it can be uh, dealing with individual species, but then we'll uh, kind of consider some uh, additional uh, complicating factors as well at the end. So there are a lot of reasons why we burn and manage invasives, and I just put together a short list of a few of those reasons here. Definitely not exhaustive. Why do we burn? To help maintain fire adapted ecosystems, prairies, forests, glades, barrens, and even some wetlands. Uh, to help maintain oak dominance in some forests. To improve wildlife habitat. Support greater diversity of plants and animals in some systems. And to help with uh, developing a habitat mosaic. So a mosaic that includes fire managed units on a landscape scale can support greater plant and animal diversity uh, in general. Why do we manage invasives? Some reasons here include maintaining natural communities, preventing extirpation of native species, reducing the negative impacts of invasives on other plants and animals, reducing negative impacts on recreational activities for people and preventing and reducing economic losses, just to name a few. And I just pulled a few um, of these uh, journal titles to kind of highlight some of those uh, reasons for burning and invasive control um, that kind of consider those topics uh, that I found interesting. Litter to glitter, promoting herbaceous ground cover. Uh, in one of those, uh, you have another article looking at how uh, fire can influence the ground cover, but then also seedling regeneration, and a couple of articles on how invasive control might improve uh, conditions for wildlife like butterflies and birds. So with that said, we've established the need and the reason why we would do fire and invasive control. So here's the it depends slide before we get into uh, some more specifics. So obviously this is not an exhaustive table of the invasives uh, that we could encounter here in Illinois or elsewhere. But I wanted to give you all kind of a feel for how uh, a species might either increase or decrease with fire, depending on different circumstances. Um, so right off the bat here on top, here we have bush honeysuckle, where one study found 
There could be increased seedling recruitment after a single burn. Another study looked at honey, bush honeysuckle occurrence. After 17 years of annual dormant season fire, they basically nearly eliminated it uh, from their site in Northern Illinois. So that's one example of a, how a fire might increase and decrease uh, the same species, depending on uh, how you're referencing it. Cerecia lespediza, this is a kind of an exciting one that we'll talk more about later, but uh, this can be an increaser with spring and dormant season burns, but then under growing season burns in the late summer, uh, there's increasing evidence that we can significantly reduce Cerecia lespediza uh, using that method. Brown leaf bittersweet, um, also a significant increase uh, following in stem densities, following burns in most cases. Uh, kind of looking at it from a different perspective, this study looked at the invasion risk of an area. So whether or not a place was burned or not, it didn't matter uh, how, in terms of how likely um, that site would be to be invaded by oriental bittersweet. So it's a little bit of a different way to look at it, but uh, in a way, it was an equivalency uh, between burned and unburned sites and that particular uh, invasive in that circumstance. Then going on to, here's an example with Tree of Heaven, like it was found to be an increaser in one case, which it typically will be. Um, but then also a couple other studies found that there was really no change in stem densities, mostly because of re-sprouts in one case. So again, kind of in, informs the complexity of what can occur uh, in the interaction of fire and invasives. Uh, this next one here is kind of an interesting case where pretty much all the studies that I found found that it increased following fire. So princess tree, I didn't find any studies uh, out there where it was noted that it decreased or had no change. Uh, garlic mustard is kind of the final one here in the table because there were studies out there that showed it kind of all over the board. So, but uh, with the right approach, um, it can still be managed with fire. So kind of an interesting case that we'll, we'll get into more deeply later, but Kind of looking at this table here, single fire increased germination in a couple of these studies. Um, in multiple studies, it was also found to be a decreaser, and this is typically with repeated annual spring fires. So under that specific regime, uh, it would be a decreaser generally. And then these other studies actually found no change uh, depending on the circumstances. So I just wanted to kind of bring that all up before we dive in, just to show you all that uh, it really is quite variable and dependent on a number of conditions. So with that, I kind of uh, blocked these off into different sections based on uh, habitat type uh, for the most part. So we're gonna start out with some herbaceous forest species and, and look at those a little more closely. And we'll start out here with Japanese stiltgrass. This is an annual shallow rooted shade tolerant grass. And um, throughout these kind of individual looks, I, I often cite uh, individual papers here and then uh, conclude with a summary of a management recommendation. So late spring fires killed all of this new cohort uh, in this first study. Uh, of the seedlings in the uh, spring burn. But then by midsummer, a second cohort had germinated and the entire site had been covered uh, with microstegium. And that's kind of uh, typical of what you see when you treat not just with fire, but uh, even with herbicides or mechanical means, you'll oftentimes get a flush uh, if you do the first control a little too early. Uh, another study found both spring and fall burns had 
overall no impact on the long-term populations. Uh, and another study found that fall, I uh, put fall in quotes there because it was very early fall and the plants were still actively growing, that fire uh, may be effective at reducing the population. And in that study, they used spot burning and propane torches, which uh, was kind of cheating because as many of you probably are aware, it's very difficult to get a fire going in the forest understory kind of in late summer, early fall because the humidity is so high. So if you could get it to burn at that time, potentially, yes, fire could be uh, used as part of a control strategy, but in all likelihood, uh, the more effective way to manage for stillgrass is going to be pre and post burn control using herbicides and or mechanical means before flowering. Um, and uh, th that's kind of going to be your best way to go about it. Uh, up next, we have garlic mustard. And this is a biennial shade tolerant forb. And as we saw in that table earlier, this is a relatively complex case that can depend on several site and phenological factors. Um, the most successful instances of using fire to control garlic mustard included sites that had moderate fuel loads that were conducted in mid to late spring. And this is especially true if you're able to burn in multiple subsequent years, as we mentioned. So spring, spring, spring. If you can do it three years in a row, you can significantly reduce the population. And I liked this uh, quote here. If properly applied, fire can control 50 to 70% of the population in the year that the treatment is applied, in this case, the treatment being the fire. Without treatment the following year, and that could be fire or other means, you could expect more than 50% of that population to return, primarily, primarily from seedlings and first year rosettes. So it's important once you start a management regime with garlic mustard using fire, that you follow up for at least another year or two uh, in order to reduce that population. So as we said, burns in at least three successive springs, trying to use fire alone or burns in combination with mechanical or herbicide applications can accelerate population reduction. So that increased germination uh, can actually have, help you to more rapidly deplete the population as long as you do the follow-up control. Up next, we have Japanese chaff flower. Um, if you're down south here, you're probably familiar or getting familiar. If you're up north, you may not have seen this one yet, um, but you probably will at some point, regrettably. Uh, and it is very problematic. Uh, this is a perennial shade tolerant forb. And as of this moment, there's only one study that I'm aware of uh, that has looked at fire and chaff flower, and it had somewhat mixed results. Um, and actually, it was a little difficult for me to interpret. <laughs> Overall, they found in response to prescribed fire that 31% of adult plants died. So right off the bat, that's not a great reduction. Uh, they also went on to say that prescribed fire decreased the survival of adult chaff flower and decreased density of chaff in juvenile and cotyledon size classes, so smaller sizes. But then they went on to say that fire did not affect the densities of adults and seedlings, and also that it is unlikely that these fire treatments can kill the chaff root system. So this being a perennial, uh, it's unclear whether or not fire in the grand scheme is going to um, help us in reducing chaff flower. I would say that more research is needed. <laughs> it's kind of the cop out, uh, but that is the case in, in this case. Um, and it could play a role uh, in an overall control strategy going forward. Um, but at this time, foliar herbicide applications are the most effective known control. 
Uh, with that, we're going to jump into a different group and look at some herbaceous open land species. We're going to start out here with spotted knapweed. This is a herbaceous short-lived perennial. And there is some good research out there that annual summer burns reduced population growth. Annual mid-spring burns reduced the densities and increased native grasses in one study. And based on these, the strategy recommended would be repeated spring or summer burns to reduce the populations and potentially to integrate that with mechanical or chemical means to improve controls. Up next, we have creeping or Canada thistle. I'd like to get away from calling it Canada thistle because that gives it the incorrect uh, implication that it might be native, which it is not. It is native to Eurasia. Uh, I'm not sure how the Canada uh, got into that common name, but uh, I'm gonna call it creeping thistle. This is a perennial herbaceous forb. And in a couple of studies, dormant season burns reduced seed production and the relative abundance. Repeated late spring burns reduced the abundance and early spring burns may actually lead to increases. So in most cases, burning tended to reduce the populations, but uh, additional controls with herbicides will probably improve the results of this species as well. Leafy spurge, uh, if you're not familiar, this is a very deep-rooted perennial forb. I've read it, the root system can go as deep as 30 feet uh, in some cases. So with that sort of root structure, you could imagine that burning is ineffective in controlling leafy spurge uh, as that source was cited. Uh, it re-sprouts following fire and fire must be combined with herbicide control uh, for successful uh, control. Uh, one study that used the herbicides Pechlorum plus 2,4-D followed by burning had 100% control after two years, which is pretty impressive uh, considering uh, that root system. So ideally the strategy is going to include either biological or herbicidal treatments for adequate control. When we were out west, we did use some biological control agents in larger populations. I'm not sure that the populations in the Midwest, in northern Illinois, they were relatively spotty, uh, would support a biological control at this time. Up next, we're going to the uh, large rhizomatous perennial grass, Phragmites. And um, this one is, uh, fire would be considered part of a integrated uh, control um, uh, system. So Phragmites was controlled when plants were herbicide treated, burned, and then the re-sprouting stems were treated again. Burning in the spring and summer can also reduce the rhizome reserves in the roots. And summer burns also depressed performance in another study as well. So in most cases for Phragmites, you burn to reduce the standing dead stems so that you can improve the contact of the new growth with the herbicide application that you would apply in subsequent seasons. But you could also burn in the spring and summer in order to weaken the plant and kind of help to deplete the root reserves, which might give you greater overall effect. If you've never seen Phragmites burn, it's pretty impressive. Uh, this image here is from uh, uh, Pyramid State Park, and you can see the flame heights behind those trees were probably approaching 30 or 40 feet. So not something you'd want to take lightly. Um, 
Up next, we have uh, reed canary grass. So this is another rhizomatous perennial grass. And um, this one, uh, there were a couple of studies and sources that noted that you could repeat annual burns while it is actively growing during the late summer, or excuse me, during the late autumn or late spring for five to six years. And that would end up in controlling Greek canary grass. And uh, this author, uh, Annan, 2011, also had a blog uh, on the same topic and um, just noted that you have to be that patient um, for the species. And um, it's kind of uh, interesting to see that most of these studies that we're citing uh, only look at um, uh, one or two years in a lot of cases in terms of fire and uh, monitoring. So it can be important to do longer term studies as you saw also with that 17 year bush honeysuckle uh, survey. Um, so it might be that you have increasers over a couple year period, but if you repeat your burns for a greater period of time annually, you could have a drastically different result. Um, also thought this quote was relevant from Missouri Department of Conservation. They noted that fire is not very effective in dense monocultures of reed canary grass where there are seeds of plants of native species are absent. So if there's nothing else to kind of take its place and fill that niche, um, it's probably not going to be very effective. So you're going to need to um, supplement uh, areas that are monocultures of free canary with uh, overseeding in most cases to be successful. So the strategy here is repeat, repeated growing season burns or similar to Phragmites, you could use the fire to burn off the duff and improve contact with subsequent herbicidal applications in uh, the next season. This is kind of a neat picture. I don't know if you can pick up, there was a, actually a fire whirl going up here in this field full of reed canary grass. Another one that produces uh, significant fire activity. Excuse me. Um, so up next, we have uh, yellow and white sweet clovers. And these are both biennial herbaceous forbs. If you're not aware, these are often lumped together uh, because they are so similar um, in so many ways. Uh, fire is well known to stimulate germination for both of these. Uh, one study found that annual burns around May when the second year shoots are visible or burning every second year in early July before seeds ripen will reduce abundance. Another study found burning can inhibit sweet clover and increase native species colonization in some circumstances. So th that study was done in May, but they used a propane torch and this was in Rocky Mountain National Park. So a little specific uh, circumstance there. In general, the strategy will be similar to garlic mustard and other biennials, where repeated spring burns just prior to bolting of those second year plants are gonna have the greatest impact. And you're gonna want to plan for follow-up, either mechanical or chemical treatments when you have to conduct dormant season burns and these species are present. Um, up next here is uh, Cerecia lespidiza, <clears throat> and this one is uh, kind of that uh, exciting new findings that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a perennial herbaceous semi-woody forb, and a study in Kansas uh, found that August and September burns controlled down to 25% of the population compared to site densities found in spring burned areas and even greater reductions 
when were found when this was combined with herbicide applications to re-sprouts. And they, this, this uh, burn regime also led to significant reductions and the near elimination of seed production. And the Illinois DNR has done similar burns, although they, had, they do not have a formal study, but the results were anecdotally very similar to what uh, I just described there. And there's some really good tips for this sort of implementation in Olson and Baldwin. Um, everything that I cite here is available at the end of my presentation. And if you get in touch with me, I'd be happy to send you a PDF uh, of any of those as well. So spring fires result in denser stands to summarize. Uh, fire can encourage seed germination, so if you follow it by herbicide treatment, this could also help reduce the seed bank more rapidly. So the strategy in general is to conduct growing season burns where possible and include herbicide applications where not possible or in combination with fire. And with that, we're gonna jump into the next section on woody species. In general, um, we, we can give some general tips for woody invasives. Uh, many will re-sprout following fire and control can be achieved or accelerated by implementing pre-fire and post-fire uh, treatments of using chemicals or other mechanical means as well. And the timing of the burns can have a really significant influence on the effects. And basically the uh, majority of species actively growing vegetation is typically more vulnerable uh, to, to dying uh, from prescribed burns. So if you can conduct the burn while the, the target species is actively growing, you'll have greater impact typically. Um, so up first, we have one of our, probably our most uh, problematic uh, woody species, I would say, Tree of Heaven. This is a large clonal deciduous tree. Um, fire can top kill the existing stems, but uh, the species re-sprouts uh, furiously and root suckers. So the re-sprouts re can return stem densities to pre-fire levels. And uh, most sources you'll see will not recommend fire as a control strategy. But this other uh, study here was, found that fire was not a significant factor in the uh, presence or density of Tree of Heaven within a a managed landscape. So a landscape, I believe it was in Indiana, um, where the uh, forest understudy was managed for timber production, and they looked at a number of factors that might contribute to whether Tree of Heaven was present and at what densities, and they actually found that timber harvest was more of a descripting, describing factor uh, in areas that had uh, tree of heaven and at greater densities. So that was kind of interesting. So another study looked at herbicide treatment and they used a mazapir combined with fire, resulted in no re-sprouts after four growing seasons. So that's pretty uh, rock star result there. Uh, so the recommended strategy is to execute a pre-fire treatment with herbicides. And for that, you would use um, a stem injection for large stems, the large stems being greater than four inches dBH. For those of you who may not be uh, familiar with a stem injection treatment, that means something like a uh, hack and squirt or drill and fill. And this image here is a picture of a tree of heaven that has been treated with a hack and squirt where you go and make hatchet cuts 
at a certain distance all the way around the stem of the tree, uh, tr tree trunk. And then you apply uh, small uh, amounts of concentrated herbicide into those cuts. And it works really well um, on these larger stems in particular. Um, this is very effective. Um, and then for the smaller stems, you can use basal bark or foliar applications. So in addition to, I mentioned that this species will re-sprout following fire. The same would be true if you just cut this tree down without using herbicide, it would send up a prolific amount of root suckers and you would have a huge patch of uh, tree of heaven where you once had one large single stem. <laughs> So that's something to consider uh, when you're dealing with this species and actually uh, another one that we're gonna mention here coming up in a few slides. Um, you do need to uh, consider uh, using herbicides for this one. Uh, up next, we have a princess tree. And this is another large deciduous tree. This picture here actually is kind of interesting as an aside. Uh, we used our drone to locate uh, princess trees in the forest canopy. And uh, these light uh, portions of the image here are actually the purple flowers of princess tree in bloom. So it's kind of easy to pick them out uh, using that drone imagery. But uh, this species in particular, thrives in forest disturbed areas and disturbance often leads to increases in this invader wherever it's present. It thrives in forest gaps and increases following fire. And the strategy then is pre-treatment uh, and planned post-treatment and monitoring is recommended for multiple years. Um, I've heard of instances where uh, even the treatment, uh, herbicide treatments, if you come back a few years later, uh, some of those treated uh, individuals that you thought you had killed might re-sprout uh, and so would require a follow-up herbicide treatment to knock it out completely. So that's something to consider with this species. Um, Bush honeysuckle. So this is a complex of multiple non-native invasive bush honeysuckle species. Uh, they're all very similar in, uh, in a way. These are shade tolerant woody shrubs. And in a few different studies here, we're gonna review. Uh, honeysuckle is generally reduced by fire. So this first one, honeysuckle and buckthorn were reduced from 85% cover down to 38% cover after only two years of burning in that study. Stem densities, as we mentioned in that table, were practically eliminated with annual fire over 17 years in a woodland in Northern Illinois. Late growing season burns, August in Wisconsin, had the greatest top kill and fewest re-sprouts versus fires in other seasons in that study. And fire did not impact the efficacy of a basal bark herbicide application in this other study. So that's something we don't often uh, look at, but this study uh, did and found that fire did not influence the ability of our herbicide treatment to be effective. So that was good. <clears throat> So generally speaking for bush honeysuckles, it appears that fire reduces the density and abundance in most cases, especially with growing season burns being the most effective. And this could be coupled with follow-up mechanical or herbicide treatments for more rapid reductions. A lot of times you'll get uh, plants that re-sprout. Uh, this one in this picture, for example, this could be fully killed or it could re-sprout uh, later on, it's unclear. And that re-sprout, uh, you could come through and do a foliar herbicide application on a plant that's much smaller in stature 
than uh, that would have been prior to the fire. So that's another management option uh, to come through and treat tree sprouts and use less herbicide uh, overall. And just to um, kind of go back and forth a little bit between slides. Oh. If you look at this picture of the honeysuckle, and this is also in the same on the same fire, uh, the fuels on the ground can play a significant role. And you can see the fuels, like the leaf litter, were not continuous up to the base of this individual. So it didn't really burn at the base of this stem. So this one's probably going to be just fine. This one, on the other hand, had quite a bit of leaf litter and had quite a bit of heat there at the base of that and probably put a lot of heat on that root collar. So it wouldn't surprise me if that individual was actually killed, killed and not just top killed. Up next, we have autumn olive, which is kind of a similar case to bush honeysuckle. It is a shade tolerant woody shrub. Uh, one study found that it germinates after high intensity fires, but was inhibited by low intensity fire, which is kind of uh, counterintuitive. Uh, another study found prescribed fire had no effect on autumn olive abundance or mortality. And the strategy for this, kind of like I was just describing, depends on whether top kill is possible and other factors. So the sprouts quickly after fire, if you get a re-sprout, you can herbicide treat the re-sprout and use less herbicide than if you had needed to spray the entire canopy of an individual like this. And just to point out in this picture, uh, if you've ever burned through a dense stand of autumn olive, you probably have seen similar situations where actually you can see the fire put itself out almost in a ring around this autumn olive tree. So there's very little herbaceous plants to carry a fire. If there's no overstory of oaks or some other uh, canopy species that drops its leaves and can carry the fire in to um, the base of that plant, you're basically going to have almost no impact on uh, that plant with the fire. And compare that to this one. This is another autumn olive, but it was in an area that had more continuous leaf litter. You can see some oaks here in the background. It's likely that that oak leaf litter uh, carried that fire into the base of this plant and will likely top kill this. It will probably re-sprout. Um, but again, uh, you'll have a much easier job treating the re-sprout than you would have that larger mature plant. Up next, we have another shrub, burning bush. Uh, and ironically, there are no studies on burning bush and prescribed fire that I could find. Uh, this was noted back in 2009 in another uh, review uh, that there were no studies then. And it appears that that is still the case, at least none that I could find. So hopefully we will remedy that uh, here um, in the coming years. But uh, I do have some anecdotal evidence here from the Ag Center. We actually have a population of burning bush and some of it is within our demonstration forest behind the office where we've been uh, running a couple of prescribed burns. And you see here a uh, pretty large individual and not just top killed, but it did not re-sprout uh, at all. So it was killed killed. Um, and there were a few, at least a few individuals like this that I came across. Uh, I'd be interested to do a more formal study uh, to see um, whether that plays out in a larger uh, scale or larger proportion. Uh, and I mentioned here the re-sprouts after cutting because uh, that was the best guess that I could find uh, in certain management guides, they would suggest that burning bush might re-sprout following fire, 
because it resprouts after you cut it down. Um, but whether or not that's the case, I, I don't know. It wasn't for that one. Um, up next, we have non-native buckthorn species. So uh, buckthorn, there were a couple of uh, non-native invasive buckthorns. These are shade tolerant woody shrubs or small trees. And for these, the findings were somewhat mixed. Some studies found decreases with fire, others found increases. Uh, the most uh, recommended were repetitive herbicide treatments were, um, were recommended. This study found uh, herbicide treatments were more effective versus propane torch on the root crown. And integrating multiple uh, control methods can reduce the buckthorn population while increasing native species diversity. So repeated herbicide treatments and uh, mechanical treatments are likely necessary for control of most buckthorns. Uh, up next here, we have Japanese honeysuckle. So another shade tolerant woody vine. Um, this one is pretty well known to be controlled by fire. In this study, half of the stems were eliminated after a fire, after uh, the buds were burst. Uh, in another start, study, um, coverage and crown volume reduced 35 and 80% after two spring burns in a site in North Carolina. And generally, fire reduces stem densities. And if you couple that with other control options, you can further reduce populations. Up next, we have another woody vine, round leaf bittersweet. This is another really problematic invader uh, along the lines of Tree of Heaven in terms of its ability to root sucker and send up sprouts uh, from its root system. And I really liked this quote. Um, <laughs> the bad news is that where bittersweet is established, fire can increase the density of oriental bittersweet by top killing stems and inducing prolific root sprouting, re-sprouting and root suckering. The density of stems can be more than doubled and they used an exclamation point, which doesn't happen all that often in scientific circles. So that was kind of fun, uh, but also terrifying. This re-sprouts and root suckers from adventitious roots. And because of all of this, it would be prudent to cut and or herbicide stands prior to burning in order to deplete root reserves. So the strategy here is pre-treatment with herbicides and planning for post-fire treatments for multiple years in infested areas. If you just cut this one, it's just gonna do kind of the same thing as it would under a fire where it's gonna send up all these root sprouts. So you want a basal bark, or cut stem and cut and treat the larger stems, and then use a foliar spray on small stems and re-sprouts. And actually this picture here is from a, an area that had burned uh, over the dormant season. And what you see here with all of these individuals kind of arching backwards, those are all root suckers of Oriental bittersweet. And some of the larger vines you can see pictured back here. Um, so a management approach in this case might be to come through and you could do relatively quick work with a foliar herbicide application on these root suckers. And you might do some real good with that. Uh, up next, I did wanna talk a little bit about um, kind of some additional considerations. And so in terms of burn preparation and practices and invasive species spread prevention, I think this is something we occasionally talk about, but probably could do uh, a better job of, uh, at least for, for some of us. Um, and so fire line spread, I think is a, a significant issue. Spread along trails in general, uh, we know occurs, so it's probably the same along fire lines. 
things like stilt grass. We have pictured here garlic mustard along a trail side that could double as a fire break. Putting in fire breaks, you want to make sure you don't have seeds either in your tread of your shoes or stuck to your clothing like Japanese chaff flower seeds to stuck to the clothes here. Um, and you need to be looking at your boot laces and all those things. Obviously, uh, the same could be true of our equipment. So all of the fluff that gets stuck to our mowers and our tractors could be blown off with a leaf blower, or if it's mud, you might need to break out the pressure washer. Before you go from site to site, that can also include our burn vehicles when we're moving UTVs from site to site to suppress fires. You want to make sure that you're cleaning off those vehicles from one site to another um, so as to prevent spread, especially in areas where you know you've got one invasive and the next area you know you don't. <laughs> so kind of common sense, but I wanted to mention it. Some additional fire considerations. You know, we've seen how complex it can be, even dealing with one individual species, considering a site with multiple invasive plants uh, and other objectives that you need to throw in. And uh, you can see how quickly it can become more complicated. So coming up with a plan, uh, a well-written plan that, um, you can follow and uh, developing the resources that you need to do follow-up treatments can be very important. Um, so that's something to consider. Climate change, this quote about <laughs> the interaction of fire, climate change, and the spread of non-native invasive species is an increasing concern. I think that's something that we're all going to have to come to terms with uh, right now, if not in the near future. Changes in fire intensities and frequencies can impact fire ecology. So just looking at this picture here with the Japanese still grass, um, pretty intense fire there on that edge would probably would not be as intense had the still grass uh, not been there. So there's going to be kind of compounding effects uh, in terms of how these invasive plants interact, but then also how fire and these inter invasive plants uh, influence the ecology of the site and that might change over time as well. And then finally another consideration how do invasive plants and fire interact to affect wildlife and in most cases we might consider uh, that to be mostly negative and it, and it very well could be uh, but this example here, uh, this quote was about growing season burns. And as you saw in some of these previous slides, we're starting to use growing season burns to combat invasive plants in some cases. So growing season burns have the greatest total bare ground area and led to an increase in overall bee abundances in this particular study. So there's a lot of unknowns out there, and uh, I just don't want us to jump to conclusions about any of this. I just wanted to point that out. So in summary, there are winners and losers with any management action or inaction. Fire is a very complex management tool with a range of effects on both native and non-native species. And a final thought, too, is that we should consider the context of the different situations in which we're burning. So uh, for example, if you're burning a postage stamp prairie up north that's surrounded by row crops, you're going to have a much different uh, need than burning landscape scale sites and mosaics in uh, sites, for example, down here in southernmost Illinois, where we have hundreds of thousands of acres of habitat. So very different circumstances uh, required very different um, implementations. And I'm closing out here with this pick of a fire that was very large, uh, just north of the Ag Center this spring than the Forest Service did, but it was creating its own clouds. And I thought that was 
pretty neat uh, from the smoke plumes that it was putting out. And with that, I will take any questions. I have a, a citation here for general invasive control. Please see the management of invasive plants in Pest of Illinois. I have that link there. And then just so you know that I wasn't pulling your leg, I have two, three, four pages of references that uh, if you really want to get into the weeds on, I'd uh, be happy to send you a PDF uh, and you can explore those as well. But with that, I will stop talking and take any questions.